we are now live. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Midtown Schuyler Bookstore's virtual event series. My name is Alex. I'm with the Schuyler. And as always, I am live in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania at the bookstore. Thank you for tuning in this evening as we welcome Lawrence Reese and Michael Nyberg. We have a really great discussion this evening for you. We're happy you're here. So thank you for tuning in. Thank you for supporting the bookstore. And we hope you enjoy the program. Um, at this time, I'd like to introduce our speakers here this evening to you. Our interviewer this evening is Michael Nyberg. Michael is Chair of War Studies at the United States Army War College. His book, Dance of the Furies, Europe and the Outbreak of World War I was named by the Wall Street Journal as one of the five best books ever written about that war. He has also written books about the liberation of Paris in 1944, America's entry into World War I and the Treaty of Versailles. His new book, which is forthcoming this fall, is titled, supposedly titled, when France Fell, the Vichy Crisis, and the Fate of the Anglo-American Alliance. Um, uh, stay tuned for more about that coming out this fall from Harvard University Press. Um, our featured author this evening is historian Lawrence Reese. Lawrence is an award-winning historian and documentary filmmaker and author of Auschwitz and Holocaust, both published by Public Affairs. Reese is the former head of BBC TV history programs, as well as the founder, writer, and producer of World War II History.com. He lives in London. Of course, his new book that we are here for this evening is titled Hitler and Stalin. Here it is, The Tyrants of the Second World War. Um, I've got to read just one blurb. This one's from Professor Robert Service, who writes, quote, coming from one of the world's experts on the Second World War, this is an important and original and devastating account of Hitler and Stalin as dictators, a must read. Um, quick, a uh, couple housekeeping notes before we get started here. First, if you have a question at any point for our speakers, please use the Q&A button towards the bottom of the screen below our faces here. We love questions from the audience. We wanna hear from you, so ask away and we'll try to get to as many questions as possible towards the end of the program. And lastly, if you enjoyed the talk and wanna support the bookstore, there's a very easy way you can do that. And that is to purchase a copy of the book. Once again, here it is. Every purchase helps support the, uh, our staff, this event series and the author. So I'm gonna drop a purchase link in the chat room for the book, click on that. It will take you to our website, midtownscholar.com we can grab a copy of the book. And once again, thank you everyone for tuning in and for your continued support. But without further ado, Michael Nyberg and Lawrence Reese. Thanks, Alex, and thanks to all of you. I hope you're all warm and safe where you are uh, during a, yet another polar vortex that's hitting all of us. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be back, even if virtually with the Midtown Scholar, and a real joy to be here with Lawrence Reese, someone whose work I have admired uh, for a very long time. So welcome, Lawrence. It's, it's late in London, but it's wonderful to have you with us. No, thanks, Michael. It's great to be here. I want to start off by asking you, uh, you've written on some uh, very important but very disturbing and difficult to deal with topics, Auschwitz, the Holocaust. I want to start by asking you as an author and as a scholar, what was it like to spend months, years uh, inside the heads of two of the worst people of the 20th century, maybe ever. What was that like as a researcher to try to get into the minds of these people? Well, I think for me, um, I, I came to it as, uh, so I always wanted to make history films. I always wanted to make history documentaries. That's what I absolutely strove and wanted to do. After Oxford, I managed to get into the BBC and I managed to start specializing quite young in making history documentaries. And I came to it through people. I came to it through oral history. I came to it through meeting people who knew Hitler and knew Stalin. And so you go right back 30 years ago, I met the first uh, uh, members of the SS, people who knew Hitler, knew uh, leading Nazis, right back, right back then. And what really hooked me into the whole thing was that their answers were surprising about what it was like to know these people. Uh, and, and it was through that that I got the, the, that I actually got into the subject. And, and it was it was hugely surprising. And it was surprising because you'd imagine that dealing and meeting Adolf Hitler would be a, an absolutely kind of horrendous experience. And yet so many of these people I met uh, were enthused by the experience, were moved by it in all sorts of ways. Um, and then when you meet people like I have who also knew Stalin, you realize that meeting Stalin was a completely different 
uh, kettle of fish because they were so terrified very often in the meetings. They were actually very extremely concerned about whether they were going to get out in one piece. So you found that there was this incredible disparity. And it was that, especially given we all know the horrors of Hitler, we all know the terrible, horrendous things that that regime did. But the mechanism of the regime, the way it was constructed, the way the leadership system worked, was clearly so very, very different than it was with Stalin. And that, that was something I got through meeting people 30 years ago. And since then, it's fascinated me ever since. So it, I didn't come to it from um, kind of uh, uh, academic work on Hitler and Stalin out. I came to it from people who knew them in that way. And so therefore, the, that whole journey became an incredibly intriguing, interesting one as you moved as you moved along it, because it was so full of surprises. This is the thing about the book that I think to me um, was just so wonderfully done on your part. I mean, it's 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 an opportunity researchers probably don't have right now, certainly won't have in the near future to actually talk to people who, who knew uh, these people and were close at, sometimes into that inner circle. That's um, that that's a that's a remarkable part of this book, and I, I do want to push you a little bit to talk maybe just just a bit here um, about some of the responses that you got that that kind of shocked you. I was thinking as I was reading your book, I think I met one person in my life who admitted to having been in the German army in World War II, none in the Soviet army. So you talk about the the way that some of these interviews surprised you in the way they went. Could you maybe talk about one or two of those and how they went? Well, the, the moment that uh, I got completely hooked on this is actually, is way back, is, is 30 years ago. Uh, 30 years ago, I, I was making a film about Goebbels. I did a history of propaganda and I was making a film about Goebbels and Goebbels as a figure really fascinated me, still fascinates me. And we managed to trace and get an interview with a man called Wilfred von Ulven, who was Goebbels' personal attache during the war. And he talked about, working with Goebbels and he said a lot of interesting things, but it was afterwards, we're having a cup of tea and uh, and we said to him, well, j you know, just if you could sum up your experience of the Third Reich in one word, what would it be? And he went, that's easy, paradise. Wow. And, and it was from that moment that you go, okay, well, there's something we've got to uncover here. We've got something we've got to actually examine here. Uh, and for, for a lot of these people, who were involved in this. And this is one of the things that I, I, hit, I hit when I was making the TV series and writing the book on Auschwitz and also even the Holocaust book. What's, what, what's one of the many, many horrific things about this, the most horror, horrible things about this is the people involved, generally speaking, with one or two exceptions are not mad. Uh, many of them are extremely uh, intelligent and a lot of them are having a really good time. I'm not saying they're necessarily having a good time being involved personally in killing, but they're having a good time because they're tremendously excited and enthused. There's a dynamism that's in operation with these people that is, they feel, tremendously invigorating. Uh, and that's really frightening. When you, when you see it and you understand it, that, that many of these people are cultured and many of them think they're doing the right thing and still think they're doing the right thing. I'll give you one example. I um, uh, met a man who was in the SS Das Reich, which as you know, is, is, not, a, is not a nice organization. Uh, and we meet the guy and he goes, meets me and he goes, uh, it's a great pleasure to meet you uh, because you're English and let's face it, uh, you know, we, it, it was terrible. What happened in the war was absolutely terrible. And I said, it's very, very refreshing to meet someone in your position who served in the war in the organization that you did, who feels so badly about the Holocaust. And he said, I don't mean that. I mean, what's terrible is we should never have ended up fighting you. Uh, it, it was a disaster. We never wanted to fight the British. Um, what happened was this total catastrophe for, for Germany. We are split into two at the end of the war. Our country's never properly recovered. And you, you lost your empire and now you're in hock to the Americans. It's an absolute disaster. Whereas together, we could have ruled the world. So what a terrible error we all made. 
And I said, whoa, OK. I said, but just to go back to the Holocaust, you know, what's your feeling now about the Holocaust? And he said, well, I've had many years to think about it since the war, and I'm prepared to say things got out of hand towards the end. Were you doing these interviews before German reunification for the most part? Was this uh, No, these were the... after. These were after. After. Because wow. so what I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no. So so no, so when he said Germany's broken, he meant Germany's broken because uh he, as 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 he saw it, uh the whole spirit of Germany had gone plus what 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 you've got to remember is you 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 know, you're an expert on Versailles. When people talk about Versailles, everyone says there's this sort of standard trope, oh, it led to the war and so on. Uh, but, but actually, people forget that Germany lost more territory at the end of the Second World War than it lost at Versailles. And someone like this guy I was talking to, they used to have estates in East Prussia. Mm. So the, as he's looking at it, the, one, one element of the catastrophe was the amount of territory that was lost essentially to Poland as part of the deal done between Stalin and the and the Western Allies at Tehran and afterwards, and so he's looking at it, going, "We never got we never got the land back anyway." So he's not looking at it as this is great, Germany's united. He's looking at it that it could have been so extraordinary, and because the British made the wrong decision, it wasn't. So this is a kind of perspective that what's extraordinary about both the mindset of the the Nazis I met, former Nazis, so the, say the former Nazis, and also the uh, people who were close to Stalin. What's extraordinary is that it's horrendous mindset and it's repulsive, but you can understand once you're in it, once you can see the circularity of it, it it may you know it's got its own internal logic. So it's like a horrible merry-go-round that once you know carousel that once once you accept a couple of their of, a, of if, if you accepted a couple of the premises, you'd spin around in it, rather like hamsters in a wheel, and you see them still spinning. Right. So th this this is, of course, as you know, still an issue that you can scratch the surface of relations between Germany and Poland. This will still, even in 2021, still raise uh, hackles among a minority, but it will still rile some people up in Germany. Another thing I really loved about the way you put this book together is the way that you myself being primarily a First World War historian, the way you understood these two men are products of the collapse of an international order between 1917 and 1919. Um, they're both, they both come about in this vacuum when the monarchies, the German and Russian monarchies are gone. And there's a real open question as to what is going to fill them. Yeah. Um, so I, I wanted to ask you, there's a couple of questions I definitely want to ask you, but I, I, I see we're already down to about 10 minutes left. We could talk oh, for a sorry, long time. No, 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 you're, you're, it's great. <laughs> um, what, what do you think would have happened to these two people if those monarchical systems had held? That is to say, I, I think I know how you're going to answer this question, but I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to right. uh, prejudge it. But, but what, what, how much of it is, is this, is that moment that occurs at the end of the First World War, and how much is it something that's in the character and drive of these people? Well, of course, you have to, you, you have to say, you know, uh, it's both, but, but overwhelmingly the circumstance, overwhelmingly yeah. the circumstance. Uh, I, I don't believe for a second that there would have been a Hitler in the sense that we understand Hitler if it hadn't been for the First World War and the manner of the ending of it. There's no possibility of that, zero possibility. The guy is an absolute loser. And this is one of the things when people talk about the power of, the, of destiny and the individual and all of that nonsense. Um, he, he's the same essential guy in 1913, uh, 14, when people recognize him to be a loser, a sort of weirdo on the extreme, as he is in 1933 when he's made chancellor. He's got the same essential character traits. It's just that the character traits he had in 1913-14 that made him a weirdo become character traits that are perceived of real value. So, for example, his uh, inability to listen to other points of view is looked on as firmness of, of, of decision making. His lack of int intimacy with other people is looked on as he's a kind of distant leader on the hilltop. Um, his, uh, uh, the fact that he has no experience of political office is looked on as great because we need a fresh person from the side. Look where the normal politicians have got us. 
you know, so all the, all, it, it's not that he's changed essentially, it's that the entire circumstances have changed and in terms of what people are looking for. Similarly, it's the perspective, with, it's the perspective changing as you're on the hamster wheel. Yeah, exactly. And, and, yeah. and, uh, but not, but not just that, but um, what happens is that he's only drawn into politics by the notion of the way the First World War ends and particularly the circumstances in Germany in 1918-19. Uh, he, he's not going to go into politics otherwise. He, right. The interesting thing about Mein Kampf is all the, all the research that's happened over the last 15, 20 years demonstrates that he, he, he understands that to be a great man, you have to have a coherent narrative backstory. So he creates a coherent narrative backstory that then a whole series of scholars have unpicked and showed that it's just not true. He's, he's perfectly happy doing deals with uh, um, Jewish art dealers in Vienna. He's perfectly happy. You know, he's, he's not somebody who is virulently anti-Semitic. He, he may be deep down, he may be latently or whatever, but, but the fact is the person he creates in Mein Kampf back in Vienna was not the person he was. It's just that he needs to be that person in order to become and be perceived as this one. So the First World War is, I think, everything. I mean, no First World War, no Second World War. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I teach it as one war. I teach it as one European 30 years war, uh, latter day 30 years war. Yeah. The other similarity that you point out between them, and there's a third individual that I would put in this category too, that they are both outsiders to their own political systems. Yeah. That is Hitler coming from Austria, Stalin, of course, coming from Georgia, and of course, we could think of Napoleon coming from Corsica, yes. another leader that rises to power as the result yep. of revolution. Yes. I, I think that comparison starts to get off the rails a little bit with Napoleon. But what is it about that outsider status, you think? that is it is it because inside a revolutionary environment, it becomes easier to look for somebody from the outside? Yeah, I, I think what it is, is it, it contributes to their sense of otherness when you're looking for something different and radical. The, the whole note, the, the problem is that if you're actually looking for a radical overturning of a system and you, you feel that the system, the current system is rotten such that it needs a revolution, well, then you can't have a revolution led by someone who's inside the system that created the need for the revolution. So it's, right. it's great that, and you know, in, in Hitler's case, it's great that he's, he's not a, an officer. This is a big deal to Dietrich Achach, who knows him in the early 20s and, and kind of almost talent picks him. Um, uh, talent spots him he says this is great because officers have let everybody down he's an uh, he's, he's a he's a simple soldier with a, the iron cross that's exactly what we need um and similarly i think with 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 stalin he's this kind of a, he's kind of um exotic creature from georgia who'd been in siberia in prison and so on and he's he he has that kind of sense of of humble peasant exoticism you know, I made a many, many, many years ago, I did a, a film about Rasputin, which is an odd subject to bring up now, but it did help me understand partly kind of this sense in Russia of the exotic, amazing East and people coming from outside of the normal central urban um, centers of St. Petersburg and, and Moscow, that he's coming, he's coming with something else. Um, and a number of people I met who knew, who knew Stalin who, who, who actually had dealings with him talked about that, that, you know, he speaks with a, he speaks perfect Russian, but with a very strong Georgian accent. I mean, uh, one English uh, officer I met who worked in the Moscow embassy, who uh, met Stalin a lot. And he, and he was obviously completely fluent in Russian, but he was shocked when he met Stalin because Stalin spoke Russian in such a strong Georgian accent. It was like, um, you know, in Britain, he said it was like someone coming from Yorkshire. So I imagine with you guys, it's somebody like coming from the, I don't know, the deepest boon, you know, deepest Midwest somewhere with a kind of like folksy drawl to it. And there's a sense that they're not, that the very accent is telling you that they're, they're, they're not establishment. Right. Napoleon had the same thing from Corsica. Um, and I don't want to draw that comparison too well, because you do make a point that I don't think applies to Napoleon in the book. You say that both Hitler and Stalin were uh, defined themselves in a way by being anti-enlightenment, which I don't think Napoleon would have identified himself. He would have identified himself as sort of inheriting it. Um, 
I wanted to ask you, you, you spoke to a number of people, I kept outlining them in the book or highlighting them in the book, who would talk about, well, in the end, Hitler and Stalin, what, what they really represented was two sides of the same coin, two, two sides of the same system. And of course, Hannah Arendt very famously made that point that they were essentially similar in the fact that they were both totalitarian, stripped the ideology away, and what they were doing was quite broadly similar. Is this yeah. a conclusion that you yourself came to as well as you were working on the book? That what became important, what be, one of the reasons I so wanted to write the book was that talking to people who were involved in going into meetings with these guys and so on, you realize they're two radically different personalities. So that, that it, it completely different experiences as personalities. They're also different as types of leader. One's a charismatic leader. One is very much a bureaucratic leader. So they're different types of leaders, but both, it seems to me, have something extremely important in common, which is that they both thought they understood the nature of life and they thought they understood the way the world ought to be and desire to create that utopia here on earth. So they're both go moving towards a utopian vision. And that in the course of that utopian vision, they understand that millions of people are going to die and they don't care. In fact, in many ways, they see that as necessary. They that is one of the most chilling parts of the book that I read that Hitler's, your point that you brought out, which just crystallized it in my mind. The reason that Hitler has such a problem with religious figures is because they're trying to do the thing he most doesn't want. They're trying to protect the weak, Yes, which is what he doesn't want. I mean, that was a, a chilling crystallization that you used. There's one remark Hitler made in private, which was um, that he wanted to see, he was really angry that the honor code amongst uh, Prussian officers and German officers was such that they were still, you know, still dueling, you know, you know, occasionally go off and duel, and occasionally you get an officer who was killed in a duel. And it made him furious because what's the point in all this training and so on if people are going to, if our officers are in any risk of killing each other, it's ridiculous. So he said, I want to see dueling banned. And then he made, this is uh, an example of a Hitler joke. Um, I want to see dueling banned. And then he paused and then said, apart from between, uh, apart from between um, priests and lawyers when he'd said he'd like to make it compulsory. Hmm. Because, and what the priests and lawyers have in common, exactly what you say, what priests and lawyers have in common is they're interfering with uh, the essential Darwinian ruthless struggle of life by coming in to protect people either on, on rule of law or protect people um, through trying to preach compassion and kindness. And again, it's something I can't imagine a European ideological system be constructed on absent the First World War, right? It's the First World War that destroys that, yes. that, that, that implants that notion of, of life as a struggle. Because with Hitler, he, or, 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 or he's always talking, or he does talk, refers back to the nature of that war and the seeing his, his friends eviscerated in front of him. And, and, you know, it's impossible for him to come out of that war without thinking that, you know, don't talk to me about arbitrary suffering and death. I think it's it's crucial in that war, he convinces himself that this nonsensical stab in the back idea that the Jews were somehow responsible for the loss of the war um, by uh, uh, plotting behind the lines, which is this warped sort of nonsense. But we all know the power of conspiracy theories because it allows a lot of Germans to feel, other Germans to feel, well, it wasn't our fault what happened, it was this secret conspiracy that, that, that did it. You know, I'm not gonna say, well, we didn't lose, you know, we, I didn't lose the election, it was these other people who, I mean, but it's, it's, a, it's a conspiracy theory, you know, mad conspiracy yeah. theory. Um, and, and, it, and so he, he's determined that in the second world war, these people who didn't do this in the first world war, aren't gonna get away with it this time. And it's not just the death of friends that he saw, but the death of two states that he had lived under, the German Empire and the Austro-Hungarian. Uh, uh, but all, and the Bavarian monarchy as well goes. That's right. You know, That's so, right. So he's, he's, he sees the entire world order around him go, and somebody's got to be to blame, and it can't be him. So I have one or two more questions that I definitely want to get to, and I see some in the Q&A already that also hit on things I was going to ask you. So I, what I want to ask you is, you talked in this book, you said that you think this book not only has a value for studying history, it also has a value for studying the world we're living in today. And a phrase you used at the end of the book really struck me. You said that this is a book not just about World War II, but about, and I'm quoting you here, the malleability of the human mind. And yeah. I want to ask you about that line, what you meant by it. Um, it's a very powerful phrase that you use near the end of the book. 
what, what um, essentially, if you, you know, I've been doing this a long time and, um, and I can't do it anymore because most people, everyone's dead now. I mean, it's really scary. That. I mean, I can't lie. all this year, all this time interviewing people and now almost all of them dead. Um, and, and kind of two, the two things I take from it. One is it's impossible to underestimate the fr uh, fragility of everything because so many people I've met have gone, everything was great. And then, you know, you talk to Hungarian Jews about what it was like. Uh, and then suddenly uh, overnight, almost they're in a, I mean, it's, it, it, the, the, everything is so in you know the institutions around us it, it, so many things are so fragile and we don't want to we somehow don't want to accept it first thing but the second thing and it relates to the malleability of the human mind was one of the most important people i've ever met in my life was a guy called uh, toy v blatt who was uh, a polish jew who ended up in the death camp of sobibor and he was in the Zonda commando in Sobibor, which meant that he was one of a tiny number of, of, of Jews who was selected, tiny number, not for immediate death. And that was, and what he had to do was go into the gas chambers and clear them of bodies. He had to do some of the most, you know, hell on earth, unimaginable horror of what he had to do. And he escaped in the revolt at Sobibor and had many, many adventures and eventually ended up living in America. And he's sadly died some years ago but I said to him okay well tell me what you've you've learned from this experience that you had an extraordinary experience and he said well people often ask me what I've learned and he said I can tell them that I've only ever learned one thing which is nobody knows themselves mm -hmm. I said the people I thought might survive Sobibor and the Zonda commando they died straight away the people I never put money on to survive they managed to somehow and he said, how you'll be changed by this, you can't know. Until you're tested, you cannot possibly know how you're going to be or what kind of person you actually are. Mm. And that that stuck with me more than almost anything because it, it, it and you think you, you, you kind of widen that out to think, well, why are, why is anybody who they are? You know, I, I have this, non, it's a nonsense, I know, I tried to, I, uh, but I have this, uh, imagine you know you, you, you're you're born and um exactly the same kind of baby as you were when you're born but it was magic back and you're in fact then adopted by um uh, uh aztecs in 14th century mesoamerica you know you're going to grow up to believe in human sacrifice and you're going to grow up to believe that's the way forward and so on so in what sense the, the raw material that you were to to, to take from toy extend toyby's analogy in what sense the raw material inherent that you are are you who you are now anyway right you, it's you, right. you're a product you're a product of your culture um i said this at a, a, a talk at a, a university once and i was saying that you can and it, it's it's it kind of i accept there's limitations in the in the metaphor you know but but i but i was saying all this and saying so what would you be and this uh, guy at the back put up saying look there's no way if I you took me back to 14th century Mesoamerica, I would be in favor of human sacrifice. I would be I would be organizing the I would be organizing the revolt group against human sacrifice. We would have been protesting. I go, I'm I'm, I'm glad you think that, but I mean, the, as far as we know from Cortez's accounts, there wasn't a lot of protest groups yeah, yeah. amongst the Aztecs to it. You know, I'm going to transition to the Q&A to a couple of questions I see here that are also questions that are in my notes. And one comes from my friend and colleague, Daryl Driver, uh, one of my fellow faculty members here at the Army War College. And basically, he's asking if you think your research, the people you talk to, supports Hannah Arendt's banality of evil idea that these are not monsters, they're people doing a job disconnected by multiple layers of bureaucracy. Uh, or maybe even Christopher Browning's Ordinary Men, the study that he did of a police battalion of, I think, middle-aged men out of Hamburg. Yeah, yeah, uh, no, I know, he, I know, I, I know in, Chris very in, well, yeah. And, yeah, and, in, in which he makes the same argument, right? There's nothing monstrous or even necessarily anti-Semitic about these people. Um, did, was that something that you came away with? I mean, both on the Soviet side, we've been talking mostly about Germany, but there's a Soviet side of, to this, of course. Absolutely. Um, kind of, it's... it's Parallel. I find myself doing this. Um, it's so much easier when you don't know a lot of stuff. I don't don't know stuff to have firm yeah. view. That's what's so awful. Anyway, but but kind of yes and no. I mean yes yes certainly in the sense that 
uh, again, another extraordinary person I met, a man called Oskar Groening, who we interviewed for the Auschwitz series, who actually worked as a member of the SS in Auschwitz. And he, uh, after the war, he wasn't prosecuted. He, he was in the economic uh, section of Auschwitz, uh, essentially counting money and sorting out the belongings of the murdered Jews and organizing the shipping of them back to back to Germany. And after the war, he became a prisoner of war for a year in Scotland, and then he was he was freed. He wasn't prosecuted. Uh, that's a whole other story. It was they knew he was in Auschwitz. The German prosecutors. It was because they had a policy then of only prosecuting people in Auschwitz who actually had been directly involved in the killing. And since the organization, the gas chambers were such that only a handful of SS needed to actually be in the gas chambers at any one time. Um, by their definition, only a handful of people who worked at Auschwitz were involved in, in the killing. So anyway, Oscar got up, he, he was subsequently prosecuted uh, in, in, after our series went out um, because they actually, all, the, the law was being altered at that point. But when I interviewed him, he was f f certainly wasn't be prosecuted. He was, um, he reminded me of my elderly uncle who was a Scottish bank manager. Uh, he with that very rectitude. And that wasn't surprising because he worked in a bank before the war. And then after the war, he became personnel officer in the glassworks and rose to be head of personnel there and rose to be a judge of personnel cases uh, for the district of Hamburg. So he's a, he's a personnel officer in glassworks. That's exactly who this guy is. So you, you absolutely would say this is a banal, perfectly ordinary personality. So that's that's absolutely true. That side of it, I can I can I can see. Where I don't think it's right is that once he started talking about Jews, he wasn't banal at all. Once he starts talking about Jews and his belief that they lost us the First World War, that um, uh, uh, it was necessary to kill Jewish children because the blood in them could grow up to be, you know, the the whole extent of this micro system within him um, uh, that allowed him to work in Auschwitz and allowed him to know and see some of the suffering and to see what was going on and allowed him to sleep at nights fine and allowed him to say in the interview, one of the surprising things about Auschwitz is people don't understand the really good friends you can make working in a place like that. Okay, that's not to me a banal statement. That's a terrifying statement about the nature of what human beings are capable of so the, so there's both at work here um yeah. and and with the soviet secret policemen i met who were involved in horrendous deportations uh, of entire nations uh, the kalmyk nation and the tartar nation the officer we interviewed there talked about well i was working under orders to do this and so on and i felt it was important um and you can see that the in his brain, the um, system, the culture that he's within it, it is allowing him to believe that creating this suffering to people he knows are innocent, but there must be a greater reason for it because I'm being asked to do it. That's to me, that's not a banal way of thinking of the world, even though his essential personality was banal. And that gets back to your malleability of the mind point. Exactly. Made. It's to me yeah. that to me that's you know what what would would you be if you were the involved in chopping people's hearts out in 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 um, the Temple Mayor in uh, in Mexico City in the 14th century? Are you a banal person because that's what banal people were doing at that time? Yeah, or even if they're born in 1810 instead of 1890 in Germany, it changes the entire even, context of, everything. of what they're but, doing. Yeah. everything and and yet nobody not, ever thinks that everybody thinks everybody wants to think that take me back then and i would i would organize the you know take yeah. me back then i'm not going to be doing this i think because it's so humbling it makes you realize you're not as in control of your life and the forces around you as you would like to believe you exactly. know I, I tell people this a, a lot when people ask me the question what lessons from history have you drawn my answer is usually we're not as in control as we think we are um uh, yeah Sorry, I, I was, Absolutely. yeah, I was going to go to a, a wonderful question from Lucia that that we could take another hour talking about. So I'm not really sure how to how to cut the question down a little bit. Um, the people that end up in the middle of this, of course, are the poles, 
Um, yeah, go and, on. Um, I don't know how to cut a question like this uh, down. My friend Alex Ritchie is now working on a book about how exactly what you talked about earlier, German ideas of loss of Poland in the First World War motivate the Nazis and motivate policy in the Second World War. Yeah, yeah. Um, may, maybe Absolutely. if you could talk just a little bit about the perspective of some of the Polish people that you spoke to and interviewed. I had the opportunity to go to Warsaw and Krakow and Poznan uh, last summer, or I guess it was the summer before COVID. Uh, and shortly after that, learned that, that my family, which I didn't know, are Polish Jews from the Bialystok area. So it's wow. an area I, I've been thinking about an awful lot more uh, than, than, I, than, I, than I did in my graduate training or anything like that. Could you maybe talk just a little bit, uh, again, I know we could talk about this for weeks, but about the, the, the views of some of the Poles that you talked to. That was Albert Foster's area, wasn't it? Danzig, West Prussia, Bialystok? I think so, yeah. Because yeah. I met, I, I, uh, Bialystok's incredibly interesting because um, you know that, it, it, I suppose it sort of goes to your question, but uh, I mean, Poland the, and the, the, the way in which it's split and the whole history and, and thing, as you said, it's, it's one of the, the, the most important stories of the 20th century and often one of the most untold and mis misunderstood. Mm. I do think that the Poles as a nation, you know, I, I didn't have any sympathy for them wanting to outlaw, you cannot say the word death camp in the context. You, you know, I, I didn't have a lot of sympathy for them trying to put people in jail for that. I had a lot of sympathy for where it was coming from because I think they've had a raw deal in the sense of right. um, thinking, oh, we, in fact, they're all, you know, I was at a dinner uh, next to this actress a few years ago and she goes, well, uh, talking about that, uh, um, she said, yeah, you're Holocaust. But she said, well, just, you know, just remember the Poles were just as bad as the Nazis. I go, no, <laughs> no, yeah. we had, the, we have this sort of big row because she's going, well, they were, that we all know they're all, and it's like, no, no, you, I think you, you know, the, three million, Polish Jews died in the war, you know, upwards of 3 million non-Polish Jews died in the war. You know, Auschwitz is built not to hold Jews initially, it's built to uh, persecute uh, Polish political prisoners and half of the sent there in the first uh, um, two years are dead. So this is before it gets involved in the exterminate. So, so they had a really rough, they had a really, they had a really rough so ride. Maybe together. we should back up just just for the group here and, and explain. There is a controversy, uh, largely sparked by Jan Gross's book *Neighbors*, which uh, the Polish government is very um, sensitive, I guess would be a good word, uh, to put the blame for the Holocaust entirely on German shoulders. Yeah, which you which you uh, mustn't do. Which you mustn't do. The fact is that there were absolutely it's complicated. I mean, you know, it's it, incredibly it, complicated. It, you know, the fact you know you look at you look at. Uh, I mentioned Toy Blatt earlier. Toyu Blatt escapes, and he, he epitomizes the complexity of it to, to me. Toyu Blatt escapes from Sobibor, and then he uh, uh, is given, he has to pay to have one farmer look after him, and the farmer tries to shop him to the Nazis for money. And so you've got an example there of a Polish Catholic who is absolutely um, kind of the lowest, the, the, you can say the lowest of the low, and yet he survives because another Pole takes him in at the risk of his own life and looks after him. So, OK, yeah. one good, one bad. You know, another um, guy uh, who uh, Samuel Willenberg, who I met, who escaped from Treblinka death camp, he joins the Polish Home Army. And there's a big controversy about is the Polish Home Army, the army of resistors. Is that anti-Semitic or not? And he's and, and I remember him saying he's, I was in one unit and they were horrendous anti-Semites. I couldn't go. You know, I was lucky to get out of it. And then he said I joined another unit. Couldn't have welcomed me more. So. It's complicated. Yes, absolutely. Complicated. There are there are incident there are incidents um, of of horrendous actions and moves against the poles against the Jews. But equally, there are instances of enormous um, uh, enormous kindness. There's a brilliant book uh, written. I can't remember the author's name at the minute. I read it years ago. A brilliant book written about Warsaw and the hiding of Jews in Warsaw that establishes actually proportionately. More Jews are hidden by Poles in Warsaw than certainly Jews hidden by Germans in in Berlin. So, yeah. so it's yeah. it's it's certainly it's certainly complicated. But you look at what's going on, for example, in Ukraine, and you look at what happens when the Germans move into um, uh, Lvov, uh, Lvov or Lviv or Lemberg. I mean, it's that that city has had so many different names in the twentieth century, depending on who was running it. But when the when the Germans move in there. Ukrainians, uh, a number of Ukrainians rise up and there's horrendous pogrom where they are involving in killing, Jew, killing Jews. 
One of the killers I met, Petra Silyonka, was involved in, was a Lithuanian, involved in a Lithu Lithuanian unit attached to the Einsatzgruppen, and he personally shot women and children, and they were absolutely up for it as Lithuanians. And so those countries are involved in killing, in killing squads and murder in a way that you can't point to Polish nationals being involved in it. And yet, you know, no one says, isn't it terrible what the Lithuanians did? I mean, it's just, so it's kind of weird the way um, history's popular consciousness is focusing yeah. on it in that regard. I think it's the biggest problem for professional historians like me who work with policy people. There's, there's almost never a straight answer in history. It is, it is really, really, really complicated stuff. You know. I was struck uh, the summer before last in Warsaw. There's a wonderful museum they have to the Warsaw Uprising and there's a whole exhibit of people from the West, George Orwell and George Kennan were the two that I remember most and their quotations about the tragedy of the West not being able to protect Poland first from the Germans and then from the Soviets. So uh, it, it is a part of the war we could talk about uh, forever. We're running short on time. It is the part of the war that I tell people uh, if, there's a, if you don't know anything about Poland in the Second World War, uh, that is the place to, 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 to that is Absolutely. the gap you but, want but also, to. Just, and also the extent to which Churchill sells it down the river, totally. Completely. And, I mean, completely. Churchill has a meeting with Stalin late at night where they um, yeah. essentially draw the new map of Poland in the back of an envelope and they, sh you know, the whole of Poland shifts uh, west. No one's done that to a country before. I mean, you, you, without telling them. And we should say too the cynicism with which Franklin Roosevelt dealt with Poland as well that, is shameful. That so. is a is a of all actually of all of yeah. them, Roosevelt's the most interesting because he is this, you know, he's the sneakiest. There's no question in my opinion. Yeah, but he's the yeah. sneakiest of the you know. But the Polish yeah. army who were fighting alongside the British at Monte Cassino, you go there now to the graveyard, and um, uh, there's this extraordinary, they were so brave in capturing um, Monte Cassino, the Polish units in the British army. So many died in the graveyard. You have written on the tombstone where they comes from. Most of them come from Lvov and the part of Eastern Poland that Churchill gave and Roosevelt gave to Stalin. Yeah. So they yeah. couldn't even go, never mind Poland becoming communist at the end of the war. They couldn't even go back to Poland because it wasn't even Poland anymore. Yeah, it's, it's a tragic, tragic story. Um, the um, I'm trying to remember his name, Lane, the American ambassador to Poland. His memoirs are called I Saw Poland Betrayed. Um, we're, we're starting to run short on time. There's a lot of great questions. We won't get to all of them. We do have one from Scott that I want to make sure uh, I do ask. Are you planning to follow up this book with a documentary film of any kind? Um, I, was, I was, but I'm not now because um, I've had a real kind of, uh, the last film I made was, I think, four years ago, five years ago, which was about people who've been in Auschwitz and what happened to them afterwards. And it was a feature length documentary and it was involving these interviews. And we'd kind of reached the end of the road with oral history in this area. And I had tried with another series I did and I did drama, I had drama reconstructions and I didn't like the way that went because once you get involved in drama grammatically, it's a whole different, it's a whole different thing. With, you know. And then I tried another way with graphics and so on. So uh, the, the, the reason I'm not, I mean, someone said, well, let's, you know, progress this book as a drama or something. And I'm not, I really don't want to do that because um, uh, I've got all sorts of misgivings about dramatic reconstructions now, having been involved in quite a few, but I've got, so, so the long answer is, no, I don't think so, because I've run out of the material with which to make the films, to be honest. So what are you working on next? I'm working on another book. I'm working on another book. And maybe there might be some TV with that. I don't know. But um, uh, but uh, I think I do think it's very difficult when you've had what's excited you about it has been the opportunity to do these oral history uh interviews and so on it's very difficult when you no longer have that element and then you sort of feel that what you're doing isn't filmically isn't as good as you did because of that because of the inherent nature of it and actually uh i think the books survive better because the material's still there uh in a way in a way that it isn't um if it, it isn't on film because the people aren't if that makes sense 
let me ask you this question as we're starting to wrap up. Um, I, I know that I've had conversations with friends of mine, including a big fan of yours, Rob Satino, at the World War II Yay! Museum in, in New Orleans. Um, we had a long conversation about this, about the challenge they see in the future of teaching the Second World War to young people who will not know anybody who experienced it. Uh, the names Joseph Stalin, Poland, Tojo, those things won't mean anything. Yep. Douglas MacArthur may not mean anything to them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. How do you see this going forward? What, what do you think is the challenge for all of us? And how do we meet that challenge to make sure that these lessons of the Second World War aren't lost? And to make sure that that some of the things I know that you certainly took for granted growing up, I took for granted growing up, uh, lessons of the Holocaust and understanding of who Roosevelt and Churchill and all of these events, how do we make sure that gets um, taught the right way to the next generation of people in an environment that, in my view, is not really all that receptive to them learning about? I, I think that's, I mean, that is a huge, huge, huge question. And it's one that I worry about, particularly in the context of the Holocaust. I do a lot of work with the Holocaust Educational Trust here in this country, and they, they, their kind of way they've managed to progress has been because some, there's still some survivors alive. And they're reaching the point now where that's getting to be extremely, extremely difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the big fear, it's not to answer it, it's, it's to make it worse, but the big fear I have is that what I see when I was running history programs was that whilst I specialized in making these films myself, I also oversaw history from all sorts of other areas. And what was interesting was that there was this absolute line in terms of filmmaking, which was this notion as to whether there was anyone alive from it or not. And, and the moment there wasn't, it wasn't just then that you had money, much many greater technical and grammatical problems in how you made the film, but there was almost a, it seemed to matter less. It seemed to matter less. You know, uh, we did a big, drama documentary about Genghis Khan. And I remember talking to the, uh, the his, uh, we had this wonderful historical advisor about that. And it was this big budget thing on Genghis Khan. And, and we filmed it in Mongolia with a Mongolian army and so on. And we were trying to work out, you know, how many wives or something did get Genghis Khan had. And the, and the guy and the historian said, well, you know, there's only, let's face it. He said, there's only two or three sources on this. And, and he said, I think all of them are corrupt. So, I mean, how many do you think he would have had? I don't know, it was like, a, and, and it's you, you see that history is becoming history history can can become myth and and not just that it can the way to get forward as a as an academic historian can then be to come up with something way left field to get yourself you know that's the way you you you, you know hey hey the first world war wasn't it a good thing you know i mean what's that you know you, kind of, you, you you see that that that, that, that kind of you, you can begin to do that you can't do that with the holocaust at the minute, at the minute, but what's going to happen in 10, 15, 20 years? Yeah. I mean, the, the lie, for example, that many Nazis put forward, which was that the, the Oscar Groening mentioned to me that it was in Rudolf Hess's, uh, the Commandant of Auschwitz book, memoir he, he wrote just before he was executed. He makes the point, okay, yes, it wasn't very pleasant what happened in Auschwitz, but it wasn't very pleasant being firebombed as a child in Hamburg by the British. You know, tell me the difference. And of course, there is lots of differences, but nonetheless, some I bet I promise in 10 or 15 years, someone's going to write a book that's going to go yeah. enough already with the Holocaust. Let's talk, you know, let's put it in the context of. And, and how do you protect yourself against that when there's no one who was there to stand up and go, I'm telling you it's different. James Lowen talks about a, a, a language in Africa that has two words. One is for the history that people are still alive to remember, and another is history that happened so long ago that no one is alive to remember it. And I've always loved that concept. And yes, growing, I, I, up, growing up in a Jewish neighborhood in Pittsburgh, I, I, Holocaust survivors were all around us. They were in our schools. My barber was a Holocaust survivor with his number tattooed on his arm that you could see as he was cutting, cutting your hair. There was no way not to know about it. And I have the same worry that you have, that in a couple of years, that's going to, that that power of that is going to change. It's going to make our, our jobs very difficult, I think. Yes. Well, and, and the guy, you, 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 um, the, that story about the uh, uh, the African word, he should have worked in TV. It's exactly right, because I'm here to tell you it's incredible. What, that is a line like that. And it's almost like it may as well be, it, once once no one's alive, it may as well be Henry VIII. 
that it's, it's, it's for, for me as an historian that's such a bizarre way to think about things because it's so easy for me to see the way in which in historical time frame the french revolution is not that long ago yet yes it's not in anybody's personal memory um, yes but but it's to so do it's, with it, the way i think human beings are processing it and in terms of how you you know there's a number of people, a number of German historians I know who are really keen on this. Then one of them said to me, uh, I was talking about this problem and he said, well, do you know what's great? Soon the era of the eyewitness will be over for this period, you know, and he was looking forward to it because it's then it's then kind of it belongs to us. You know, that's it's right. No longer in the, in the, in the, in the right. kind of zeitgeist of the moment. It belongs to us. And where you go with that, I, I mean, you've got to say, on the other hand, on the other hand, and more be, be more positive and less doom laden. The fact is that. Um, the First World War is still, uh, people are still moved by stories of the First World War. It's certainly Britain. There's lots of films made about the First World War. It's still influential and so on. The problem becomes that myths become enshrined. Yeah. What happens is that, you know, we, we, I was trying for ages to show how actually at the end of the First World War, you know, they do learn some lessons from the Somme and with the end of the first world war they're able to progress on there's a lot of as you know very gifted scholars who've done a load of work on how actually with the creeping barrage and all those things actually things you know they, the psalm is a is a is a point on a spectrum but in our country we can't it's it's in absolutely infused that the leadership was atrocious that um people were killed yeah. lambs the slaughter and so on um and there's no understanding that actually we lost so many people in part because it's one of the few European wars that we were the people who were actually central to it. Um, and in the second world war, it was the, the, the red army that sent. Yeah. Um, yeah, but you I, can't I, get that out of, out of the, the, the zeitgeist. You can't do it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know we're running short on time. I, I would say that I, I think the first world war, my generation of scholars benefited I think from the fact that there weren't veterans who would stand up and say, no, no, this was my experience yeah. and you're yeah. wrong. So it, it's, it, again, it's complicated. Um, yeah. What I think it is, and I'm gonna try this as a segue, what it is a call for is more books like yours and more people like you doing everything that they can to get this done while they can and writing so beautifully on such incredibly difficult topics. And again, I tip my cap to you. Uh, these are not easy subjects to write about. They're certainly not easy subjects to talk to people about. Um, I've never worked on film, but I can imagine they're not easy things to film either. So uh, Lawrence Reese's Hitler and Stalin, the Tyrants and the Second World War. Alex has put the, the link up. I would second all of the praise that Robert Service gave to the book. Uh, and I will turn it over to Alex Lawrence. It's been wonderful to talk to you. Thank you for staying up late with us. And I uh, hope to meet you uh, in person in London soon. Yes, please. It's been a great pleasure, Michael. Thank you. All right, uh, Lawrence, Michael, thank you both uh, so much. What a, a brilliant, fascinating conversation. I always say it's, it's good when I just want the conversation to go like a whole another hour. Just like keep going, keep going. That's like the perfect place. Um, so Lawrence, congratulations. The book again is Hitler and Stalin. Um, look in the chat room, we provided a link there. Click on that, it'll take you to our website. Some great questions from the audience tonight. Sorry, we couldn't get to all of them, um, but we appreciate you tuning in. And um, thanks again, Lawrence and Michael, and uh, have a good night. Yeah, thanks a lot. Take care.